Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to Stanford University and uh, a workshop, first of a series of five workshops on decarbonizing the grid. My name is uh, Charlie Kolstad. I'm a professor here at Stanford and uh, uh, co-faculty director of uh, Bits and Watts Initiative. And I'll, uh, I'll introduce the uh, others as, as we go along. Uh, we should have a, a very interesting workshop. Um, this will last uh, two hours and we'll have time for question and answers uh, in the second half of the set of presentations. This is our schedule for, um, for the spring series of workshops. And then we'll talk, I'll talk about today's workshop. Uh, the, each of these is two hours. You know, my wife asked me this morning, have we learned anything from a year of Zooming? And I think one thing we have is that uh, Zoom fatigue sets in pretty quickly. So these are two hour workshops. We hope to cover a lot of material over the, uh, the next couple of months. But today we're, we're scoping things, uh, looking at the challenges of decarbonizing the grid. And of course, what we mean by decarbonizing the grid is the electric power system, getting the grid to work properly with uh, decarbonization of supply and uh, high levels of reliability. Um, on March 3rd, which is two weeks from today, we'll start to drill into some of the issues of doing that. And one of those is the role of a grid interconnection for decarbonization. And then at a date, uh, a couple of weeks, two, three weeks later, we'll talk about public policies to facilitate decarbonization. As we all know, at least those countries that have heavy coal uh, dependence or at least moderate coal dependence, turning off the coal is not quite so easy and public policies can, can certainly facilitate that. And then a little bit later, uh, we'll talk about storage, very important part of this. And uh, batteries, of course, but beyond batteries as well. And then we'll, we'll uh, also be talking about, in the, in the last of these, talking about coordinating demand side flexibility. Then I don't have it listed, but, but we'll close out with, with something like today, uh, uh, at the end of, April, April 28th, I believe it is, um, a view of what it takes to bring the uh, decarbonize the grid down to 80%, down by 80% by the year 2030, which the Biden administration has announced as a goal. And we know goals are, goals are to be broken, but they're also there to provide some push. Other countries have similar, similar goals. Today's workshop, uh, first hour, we're going to uh, have a series of speakers talking about different perspectives in uh, what, just what the, it's the meaning of grid decarbonization and what are some dimensions of the challenge. And then in the last uh, 45 minutes or so, we'll have a Q&A session. Uh, I'll ask some questions to start with and uh, the audience as well. Now, if you have any questions, uh, please direct them to the uh, Q&A button at the bottom of your uh, screen. Uh, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to them. If they're clarifying questions, we'll try to address them during the individual talks. But if they're general questions, we'll hold them for the, for the Q&A. And, uh, um, and I should add, finally, that if you have any problems, um, Wahila Wilkie, uh, who's uh, the, our, our, uh, one of our gurus in, in the office, will be able to fix any problem you have, and her email is listed. The, the first thing is, you know, why is electricity is a, a target? Now, most many of us who, who work in this sector know full well why it is. It's it's where the low hanging fruit is, and, but it's 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 easy to easy to understand if you look at where the greenhouse gases are coming. This is a glo global sources of greenhouse gas emissions. Now, electricity is just the intermediate good, so it doesn't show up here, but energy is where three quarters of the greenhouse gas emissions come from. And if you look at the outer ring uh, or the next outer ring, you'll see it's either in buildings, 
in uh, transportation or energy use. And this to me explains why you can summarize most greenhouse gas policies countries have by uh, two steps. One is electrify energy demand. Get most of the fossil demand that's in this three quarter red slice of pie, uh, move it into electricity. Explains why uh, electric vehicles, such a push on them. And then once that's been done or simultaneously with that, get the carbon content of electricity down, decarbonize the electricity sector. And as you can see, if you're successful in that, uh, you've, you've eliminated a very large percentage of the greenhouse gases uh, globally. So uh, some of my data is gonna be uh, US focused. Pardon, my, pardon me for doing that. Uh, you know, it's, it's the old joke about the, uh, why are you looking for your keys under the lamppost? The data is readily available on this. This is a, an interesting uh, graph that shows time along the, the bottom. And this shows when all of the currently existing electric generating capacity, capacity in the United States was built. So this is the current capacity by vintage. And if, if you look at the, this, the scale, it's, it paint, paints a picture of a coal being the popular uh, source in the 60s, particularly the 70s and the 80s after the uh, OPEC action in 73 raised the price of oil. And uh, it, it sort of died down uh, to a large extent, the, the, at least the initial building of coal plants in the early 80s. Natural gas uh, also went through a price crisis in, in North America anyway, in the uh, uh, concurrently with coal or concurrently with oil. And it wasn't so popular in the uh, 70s, 80s and 90s. But then in the, this century, natural gas all of a sudden became everybody's friend. And fracking uh, was largely responsible for that, but not entirely. And then as we moved to around 2008 or eight or nine, we saw, see renewables really start to kick in. And this only goes to um, 2016, um, but you see renewables are really taking a big step forward as being the leading new source of electric, electric generation and, along with gas. Um, this is the, uh, where the uh, electric, where the, gen, the generation fuel of choice up to the present 2020, and then where the uh, US Department of Energy, post-Trump, I should say, uh, the forecasts pre during the Trump administration are somewhat different. Uh, this is the uh, came out in, earlier this month. Um, renewables are obviously in everyone's eye as as picking up a lot of the slack from fossil sources, particularly coal. But we know that problems reliability make that um, not so easy. So let me talk about just a couple of the problems associated with um, the decarbonizing the grid. Um, and, and mostly it's reliability. I mean, energy, electricity is, is kilowatt hours plus reliability, two things together. And uh, um, the renewables provide the energy, but the reliability is, is sometimes sacrificed. There's a lot of, as we move forward, a lot of massive unpredictable fluctuations in renewable supply over a day, obviously with solar and wind and over seasons. Um, I have solar on my house and I've noticed the generation dropped to nearly zero in, the, in January uh, to, uh, to, because of the angle of the sun and the length of the day. Uh, this is particularly problematic if you have a high penetration of solar, wind, and EVs. Uh, this, this curve, which most of the audience I'm sure is familiar with, is the, is the famous duck curve. It does look like a duck. And what you see, and this is, this is a mixture of actual and, and forecast, is you see that during the uh, daytime hours, particularly in the afternoon, 
solar and wind are really reducing the uh, net demand. It's a typical spring day, and this is for California, reducing the net demand. And uh, as you see, as that duck's belly starts to drag on the ground, uh, curtailments are obviously needed. And in fact, you need curta curtailments far before that uh, to, to pr preserve reliability. And then when the sun starts to set, you need a dramatic ramp up needed to, um, to satisfy demand. That's the uh, late afternoon, early evening ramp. And um, as, as it also says, there's, this is not purely hypothetical. The actual ramps are uh, that California uh, and, and bottom of the load, net load are actual numbers from, uh, from the, this, the year in question. And then to top this off, we have uh, electric vehicles, which I'll talk about next, which create a lot of randomness and stochasticity and supply and demand. So here we have a, a simulation from one of our faculty, Ram Majagopal, um, of what happens with 50% uh, electric vehicle penetration in California or in the Bay Area. And what we have here is graphs uh, of, uh, I'll look at a series of these with uh, home charging taking 80% of the charging, office 20% and stationary stations, distributed stations, nothing. And you see, of course, there are a lot of assumptions here. We have uh, incentives could be provided to move demand around. This is get, uh, making a lot of assumptions of that sort. And as we, as we go along by tweaking the fraction in the office and, and the fraction at home, uh, we get changes in the uh, demand from electric vehicles. And we have the grid peak power increasing between 22 27% in this simulation. And these results result in significant transformer overloading, local transformer overloading. Just you know, th think about your, your block where you may live if you live in a city or, or suburbia with everybody plugging their uh, uh, electric vehicles in uh, level two or level three electric vehicles uh, when they get home. So that's that's, beyond grid stability that's talking about distribution uh, stability. Okay, so the solutions, at least uh, as we've conceptualized it here, uh, the, a big problem is the randomness, the stochasticity of both supply and demand. And uh, this could be usually often is daily uh, stochasticity, not knowing if the clouds, cloud cover, what the cloud cover actually will be, but it could also be seasonal as we've seen during the storm in parts of the United States that have uh, um, surprised, in quotes, uh, the grid and caused uh, uh, a real problem with reliability. But so one way of dealing with stochasticity, it's basically what insurance markets do, is expand the interconnection between regions in, in order to buffer uncorrelated shocks. Um, long distance transmission, a lot further than we have now. Somewhat, something like China is building between Mongolia and Beijing. Um, but transmission, transmission lines in Europe and North America are notoriously difficult to permit and construct. Uh, so everything here has a rosy side and a not so rosy side. Uh, enhancing storage, batteries. Batteries are everybody's Hope, hope for savior in this uh, the reliability issue, but costs are high and the interface with, interface with generation may be difficult. Um, but better coordinating demand side flexibility. Now I'm an economist, so I think all problems have price solutions, but prices may not be a perfect way of shifting demand quickly within a day. Maybe other mechanisms may be needed. And then finally, uh, policies to facilitate decarbonization of supplies, which I've talked about. Um, politics um, can make logical steps difficult to undertake. I hate to say that, but it's true. So um, with, with that introduction, uh, let me uh, um, introduce our 
uh, guest speakers today, and um, we'll take them in this order. Larry Beckendahl will speak first. Uh, Larry is the uh, Vice President of Grid and Architecture and Systems Operation at Portland General Electric in uh, Portland, Oregon. Um, and we're really pleased to have him and all the others here with us today. Heidi Westlake, who gets a uh, blue ribbon for getting up the earliest of anywhere. She's calling from Melbourne, Australia. Uh, she, she's with Origin Energy and is the group manager for sustainability strategy. Thank you very much for being with us, everybody, but particularly Heidi. And then finally, uh, Patrick Pansias Tichi. Sorry, Patrick, for the not, not getting all the syllables there, but uh, he's from RTE. Um, in France, grid operator in France, a senior scientific advisor, and uh, we're really pleased to, to have him with us. He's uh, sacrificing his dinner hour um, for us. Great, and uh, good morning. Thank you, uh, Dr. Colstead. Uh, appreciate uh, the introduction, appreciate being here, and uh, for your thoughts as you bring us together and thinking about uh, this clean energy future. Um, which presenting challenges. So Larry Beckadall, uh, Vice President of Grid Architecture Integration and System Operations here at Portland General Electric. And uh, the, along with uh, being here, uh, I'll just mention that we're right in the middle and, and uh, trying to work our way through an ice storm that uh, started this weekend and uh, has been a, a real challenge to putting ice on wires uh, and adding a little wind is, is by far uh, the worst thing you can do to an electric grid. And uh, so we've uh, had our challenges with over an inch of uh, radial ice on our wires and, and uh, um, putting all the pieces together. So uh, this is a one, one in 40, almost 50 year. I think they go back to 1962 being a comparison with the Columbus Day uh, storm here in the Portland area. We haven't seen anything uh, quite like it since then. So, so might be, I guess my apologies um, if, if, if I uh, am maybe not quite as sharp. Uh, there's been a lot of long nights here, we'll just say, uh, as we walk through. But thanks. I appreciate being here. Um, and, and we'll just say Mother Nature is changing. And uh, as we think about a clean energy future and, and what the impacts are, um, you know, whether it's wildfires or it's extreme weather conditions like ice storms, um, you know, these are things that we all need to be considering when we think about resiliency and a system of the future. Uh, Portland General Electric, um, who, who are we? We were established here in 1889 in, uh, in Portland, Oregon. We serve roughly 75% uh, of the commercial industrial and about 50% of the, the population here in the greater Portland area. And a uh, little bit of information about us. I like to always uh, remind that uh, the first uh, high voltage AC transmission line was built from Willamette Falls to uh, Portland, Oregon uh, downtown. Um, and it was built here right after the Chicago's World's Fair in which there was the battle over AC versus DC. And uh, the AC won out at the uh, Chicago World Fair. And then they built the line over here. And, and uh, I, I debate that sometimes whether we were pioneers and innovators or they just wanted to build it somewhere remote in case it didn't work, uh, they could bury it. So um, either way, we think of ourselves as being innovative in the start of our industry. I do like quotes. Uh, this is one that I really uh, appreciate uh, thinking about where are we going in that future? And we've got to get ahead of it here. So let's meet the future together. And what does that really look like? And as we think about the power supply, uh, I think uh, Dr. Cole said, give us that, that sense of what our power supply might look like, the vehicles we might drive, the materials we purchase and the buildings we operate and work in all plays into this future that we, uh, we think about. For Portland General Electric, we've put a goal out there that we will be net zero on greenhouse gas emissions by 2040. And uh, we will reach an 80% by uh, 2030. Um, so we have coal plants. We just shut down the Boardman plant uh, here in October. And um, in the future, uh, we have a coal strip plant ownership that uh, we see as, as well. Uh, but those are large plants being taken out of the system. And, uh, and as we're adding renewables, how is that impacting uh, us across the, the region? So I see a future that is 
Um, much like we're building a wheat ridge uh, facility right now, the wind turbines are up. We're now adding, adding battery storage and we're adding solar uh, as well. And so we wanna see the combination of them working together and hopefully gaining additional capacity and resiliency out of a system um, that works there together in that way. I also see a future of electric vehicles and uh, not that this particular brand, but uh, um, the number of electric vehicles and where they're going to be stationed. And I would say that fleet service is going to be coming faster uh, than even the, uh, I'll, I'll say the individual uh, consumers vehicles. Um, very, very popular right now and very cost effective for fleets um, such as an Amazon or a, a Federal Express uh, or, or even um, you heard uh, President Biden referring to the US Postal Service and changing its whole fleet over to electric. So we're gonna see a huge impact due to uh, electric uh, vehicles and this whole transformation of transportation. Also the future, we talk about batteries. And so uh, as, as uh, Dr. Colstead brought up that issue, it's gonna be in substations, it's gonna be at generating sites, it's going to be in, in neighborhoods, it's gonna be in homes. And uh, we will think and act and look to how do we operate those batteries across our grid. And here's just a, a quick example. Um, we started a, a, a pilot project here. Uh, we have what we call the smart grid test beds. We have three different communities uh, that our customers uh, are involved with us in, in developing what we think is the uh, energy supply of the future. And in part of that, we have residential customers that uh, now we're selling and, and working with uh, installing uh, residential batteries in their homes. And with that in mind, we can actually control those batteries. So we can influence when they charge and or decharge, de if you will, and feed back to the, uh, the grid. And so uh, we've been doing that as a demand response type program. And this is just a quick chart to show you uh, the testing of some of that. And um, so we see a future with a lot of homes that have flexible load, as well as uh, storage, and as well as uh, influencing of charging times, uh, as well as uh, photovoltaics on the rooftop. So all of those critical elements will make a real difference. Here's another uh, chart. This is uh, we, we, our system uh, this particular day uh, peaked out at just under 3,300 megawatts across Portland. And what you're seeing in the blue line is uh, that we triggered right around 7 p.m. Uh, to call for demand response. And so, you know, it's only 50 megawatts or actually it was about 70 megawatts uh, or 55 megawatts on that particular day. Um, and this is in the wintertime peak. Uh, summertime, right now our program, we have about 80 megawatts, but to be able to show how demand response can really start to make a difference on our systems, and uh, that, that we all need to be making that visible in our systems and how we operate to try to optimize when we have that flexible load uh, to, to help us balance with the renewables that are, that are being placed on the generation side. So here's what that future looks like. And if you have that demand response and whether it's batteries and homes or the vehicles, et cetera, we would like to call it the virtual power plant. And so you can see here a, a future with wind, solar, hydro in the, in the west and the northwest, we have about 50% of the capacity is, is provided by hydro. Um, but as we remove the carbon emitting uh, generation out, uh, what are we injecting? And one of the critical elements is going to have to be that virtual power plant. And in order to maintain reliability, to maintain that, that the system uh, when the wind's not blowing or the sun's not shining. And um, so all of these elements come into to play. Now, something that we, I didn't show on here, and I think there's a real conversation right now, and, and Dr. Colston didn't have it in his slides either, is hydrogen. How does hydrogen play into this? Again, as another resource that uh, when we have excess uh, wind or solar or hydro that we could actually generate uh, hydrogen and store it and then use it as a generating source um, as we go into the future. So in the Northwest, this is kind of a quick snapshot of what our typical generation looks like. And you can see where I mentioned the hydro is about 54%. You see the coal, you see the natural gas, you see the other um, uh, wind, uh, small nuclear and biomass. Um, but to take 
22% uh, for us of coal and or natural gas out of the system to, to decarbonize uh, is a huge impact in terms of reliability and how we operate the system uh, when it's not, when wind's not blowing or the sun's not shining. And so those, that's the challenge before us. And um, again, here's another view as we think about the, this is an actual look for us here in Oregon um, and the transformation and what it's going to take uh, to, to inject other types of generation into the system by 2050. So one of the things that we really do, as we mentioned, we, we talk about um, what is the um, reliability and, uh, and, and also uh, from a adequacy pers perspective, what do we have coming and, and what do we have for reserves? And so this is a snapshot from the Northwest Power Pool. Um, you can see kind of the, what the Northwest is there, uh, 73,000 megawatts uh, shown that particular day, this was a couple of weeks ago, uh, that pie chart represents the amount of, of load compared to a forecast. And so here in the winter time, you're about 95% shown in this pie chart. But on the right-hand side are, is a little, those two little bars. And, and the purple represents, we require 3% of our uh, load uh, at all times for spinning reserves and 3% for contingency reserves. So we have to have a margin of 6% available at all times. And then the green bar next to it is a forecast of what reserves might be out there. And so uh, to represent, to say, you know, uh, do you really have the adequate uh, reserves standing by? And so when it gets really uh, tricky, as we all think about it, is you're getting close to a peak load, like 95%, but if you didn't have reserves, what would you do? And uh, so we think about that. You could see how California stands this particular day. You could see how the, the desert Southwest looks uh, this particular day. But we impact each other across the, the West. Um, when, uh, when an outage takes place in California, we have both uh, the California, Oregon intertie. We also have the DC intertie that uh, you know, is between the Northwest and California, huge impacts and flows. And so as Dr. Colstead showed that duck curve and uh, what happens during the day is there's excess generation and, and it's coming our way to the North. And um, you know, we appreciate it because we get low cost energy coming our way. But then in the evening time, when that duck curve takes place and the, and the, and the solar in California goes away, there's this huge sucking sound that you can hear coming from the Northwest feeding back into California to make up that difference. So, so we, we do interact very closely across these regions and we all influence each other. And so we've got to think about the impacts across um, uh, because the electrons traveling at the speed of light really don't uh, pay attention to the uh, state borders. So with that, you know, and, and thinking about this grid of the future, um, I might entice you to uh, take a look if you were to go on to YouTube and look back at uh, uh, John F., President John F. Kennedy's uh, speech at Rice University, where he talks about going to the moon. And he talks about building this uh, spaceship that's over uh, 300 feet long and it's made out of metal alloys that haven't even been discovered yet. It's got control systems that haven't even been designed yet. And uh, we're gonna take this ship and we're gonna put people in it. We're gonna go up to the moon. It took us 10 years to do that. But I think about our grid in a similar way. We have a challenge in front of us. We don't have the answers on how we're going to do reliability, but we have some fundamentals. We have some thoughts and, and we're going to continue to develop. And this is our chance and our time to really make the difference. And if we're going to achieve the greenhouse gas uh, goals that, that, and, and creating an environment that's better, um, then we need to be thinking about this aspirationally. We need to be thinking about how we're going to make the difference here. And so it's a challenge. I would say for the Northwest right now, we're as much, uh, probably more concerned between now and 2030 as we transition than as the new technologies come about and, and be 2030 and beyond. Uh, but this is a real challenge for us all as we think about going into the future. So I leave you with just a couple of thoughts. Um, I call it words from Bert because Bert was a, a Uber driver that I had. And uh, 
Well, I jumped in the, into his car. He began to, to talk, and I told him, you know, I was involved in uh, you know this grid architecture and and what's happening with the electric utilities. And uh, he said, well, there's just a couple of things of advice. He said, one, creativity takes focused time. So are you spending focused time to do this? He also said, if you can see it, it'll happen. And then he, his, his last word of advice was, if you're excited about it, it'll even happen sooner. And so I leave you with those words of, of wisdom from Bert, my Uber driver, uh, that really, this is all a great challenge to us. And I really look forward to being a part of this for our industry. So thank you. Larry, thank you very much. Uh, um, and, th and thanks to Bert, too. Uh, he's probably president of Uber by now. Um, we do have one question, um, which well, actually we have several questions, but, but one clarifying question. You talked about demand response, and this is from Hendrik Menka. Is there an incentive for customers to participate in the demand response program? Uh, obviously, there is, but uh, maybe just briefly describe yeah. that. Yeah, there's, there's two things. One, all of our customers uh, it's available for, and there is an incentive program for them to participate. Uh, but if you're in the, uh, the smart grid uh, uh, test beds, um, it's an opt out feature. So everybody's included, uh, but you can opt out. It started out as um, I'll say the non-firm, meaning that text messages or email notes came. And if you performed and changed, uh, then you got the credits. It, and now it's become you know, a control of your thermostat, a control of your hot water tank uh, that you can uh, participate in and that's really making a big difference. So yes, it is an incentive. Uh, it should be shared. It should be a win-win for both the you know, utility and for the customer. Thank you very much. So we better, uh, we better move along um, and uh, turn to Heidi Westlake from, uh, from Origin. Um, I already introduced Heidi, but um, I'll turn over the controls to her now. And thank you again, Heidi, for joining us from down under. So yeah, it's really, um, really great to be here. Appreciate you having me from Australia. And um, today I was just going to talk to you a little bit about how we are approaching our decarbonisation journey here at Origin Energy. Um, so a little bit about Origin for those of you who are probably not familiar with us. We're one of Australia's leading integrated energy companies. We provide a diverse range of products and service offerings, and that includes electricity, natural gas, LPG, um, liquefied petroleum gas, LPG, broadband, and that's to over 4 million customer base. Uh, we own, operate and contract electricity generation portfolio of over 7,000 megawatts. And that's from a range of energy sources from traditional fuels like coal. Um, and our only coal-fired power station, Araring, is Australia's largest coal-fired power station, um, natural gas and renewables and storage. We're also one of Australia's largest installers of solar panels. And we've helped around 80,000 homes use solar energy. And we're Australia's largest buyer of utility scale solar. And um, we also have an integrated gas business and we are the upstream operator of uh, and have 37.5 shareholder in Australia Pacific LNG and they supply natural gas to domestic markets and export um, liquefied natural gas under long term contracts internationally. So. At Origin, our purpose of getting energy right for our customers, our communities and our planet really does underpin everything we do. Decarbonisation and action on climate change is really central to our purpose. Um, as a large energy company, we play a critical role in a lower emissions future. Um, and for us, uh, that lower emissions future is really critical, but we also have to ensure that customers have reliability, um, which we've addressed in a couple of other slides, but also affordability, which has been a challenge here in Australia today being able to hit what we call the trilemma. So emissions reduction, reliability and affordability. And so we've been taking action on climate change for some time. So our position on, we frame the way we think about climate change by four real, uh, four commitments. We unequivocally support the Paris Agreement and measures to progressively reduce global emissions. We believe our sector and our company should be at the forefront of reducing emissions and we are committed to lead the effort to decarbonise the Australian economy. 
We believe the electricity sector needs to deliver more than its proportional share to enable the economy to transition to a low carbon future. And uh, a lot of that is around the role that electricity can play in decarbonising not just our portfolios, but our customers as well. And we've long advocated for clear government policies to achieve Australia's 2030 emission reduction targets and a goal of net zero emissions for the electricity sector by 2050. And uh, we also have an aim to achieve net zero emissions by 2050. For for those of you who aren't familiar with the politics of climate change in Australia, it's quite fraught. We've lost a number of prime ministers um, who have tried to take action on climate change. We used to have a carbon price and that has been removed. So, so it's been, um, and coal is a, a very big part of our um, national electricity market here, makes up about 75%. So it's been an area that's been quite fraught from a political sense and in and as a result of that, the policy environment, um, the ability to have a national uh, approach to addressing this has been, been quite challenging. Um, we have, however, recently had our Prime Minister seemed like he's trying to move his messaging towards trying to agree to a net zero 2050 target for Australia. But we'll see how that goes in the party room. Um, we also have validated and approved science-based emissions reduction targets, and that's to reduce our scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. And um, we, we plan to update those for a 1.5 degree pathway. Uh, I'm sure you would have seen in the press and elsewhere that climate change is receiving increased focus. And this includes from investors and analysts. Um, there is also increased consumer and community awareness around environmental considerations. And we are seeing an increasing number of shareholder resolutions focused on climate change. I guess we had thought that with COVID that um, the rate of the transition and expectations in regards to this might fall off a bit, but what we've seen is actually the opposite that it seems to be um, accelerating. Um, by way of example, uh, we, there's a shareholder group, Climate Action 100, which maybe other members of the panel are familiar with as well. Um, they're an investor coalition of over 500 investors, uh, 52 trillion of assets under management. And their main goal is to ensure the world's largest corporate greenhouse gas emitters take necessary action on climate change. Um, for us, Climate Action 100 represents about 20% of our shareholder registry. So in other words, they own 20% of the company and we engage directly with this group and other stakeholders to ensure that they understand um, how we're thinking about and approaching climate change and decarbonisation. So in order to support our decarbonisation journey, we have a decarbonisation strategy that's summed up by what we call our five pillars of decarbonisation. So part of that, I previously mentioned, we have a coal-fired power station, Araring. Um, so we've committed to exiting coal-fired power generation by 2032. Um, prior to the retirement of Araring, it will continue to play a really valuable and quite critical role as one of Australia's most flexible and efficient coal plants. Um, given its flexibility, it basically has the ability to be able to cycle up and down more efficiently than other plants, which allows us to respond to market conditions and address some of those issues. Um, we've heard previous speakers speak, uh, speak about that happen when we have renewables coming into the system. Um, it also allows us to ensure that you know, uh, the reliability of our energy supply to our customers at a lower cost. Um, our next pillar is around growing renewables in our portfolio. Um, at the moment, we are targeting 25% of our owned and contracted generation capacity to be made up of renewables and storage. Um, we currently uh, have a 530 megawatt wind generation uh, project called Stockyard Hill, which is under construction and that is expected to be um, finalised this calendar year. Um, the third pillar is around uh, utilising our strong gas position as a lower emission fuel. So um, as we've highlighted before, potentially gas fire generation is really is a perfect partner for the increase in the intermittency associated with renewable generation in the national electricity market. Um, and given its ability to be quickly switched on to meet demand and even out the supply of energy when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing, it's quite critical to the transition, particularly here in Australia, where we have such a large, uh, large capacity of coal to replace. 
Um, a third one is around our customers. So um, not only are we trying to decarbonize our business, but we're also working with our customers to how we can help them decarbonize as well. So we continue to support our customers with solar products. We have an ongoing program of assessing and trialing a number of new technologies and business models. We have a future energy arm as part of the business that will give customers more control over their energy usage. So some of those things are uh, things like a virtual power plant. So that allows us to orchestrate a range of distributed assets, a behavioral demand response product spike. Um, and so quite similar to some of the things that Larry has already mentioned. We're also running a smart EV charging trial and transitioning our fleet up to EVs where possible. Um, in integrated gas, our uh, integrated gas business, we're exploring the development of zero and low carbon fuels, including green hydrogen and green ammonia. And probably the other, the, the other key pillar, which is really important to us here in Australia, is also the demonstrating leadership in climate change advocacy. So we have for a long time uh, been advocating for climate change action, um, including the progressive decarbonisation of our energy sector and ensuring that the policy settings enable this to happen in an orderly manager manner. So we have our strategy and then we have some targets which support um, how we progress towards our strategy. Um, as a leading energy company, we've long recognised we have responsibility to address climate change and we have taken some quite ambitious steps that very few in our sector of Australia have taken. Um, in 2015, we were the first energy company in the world to sign up to the first seven We Mean business commitments to accelerate action on climate change. And in 2017, we were the first Australian company to have emissions reduction targets independently validated and approved by the Science-Based Targets Com Initiative. Um, so those targets commit us to reducing scope one and two greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2032. Um, a large portion of that will be achieved by the retirement of Araring. And we also have a scope three target to reduce the emissions across our value chain by 25% by 2032. Um, last year, we also put in place a new short-term target to reduce scope one emissions by 10%. And that's over a three year period and is linked to executive remuneration as well. Um, and as mentioned previously, to support our and significantly grow renewables in our portfolio decarbonisation pillar, we're targeting for renewables and storage to make up more than 25% of our generation mix. So while it's important to make these commitments and have targets and strategies, it's equally important to be able to have be able to progress actions that support those targets. And this is just a snapshot of some of the actions that we are taking. Um, our solar business continues to grow. Um, it was up 22% in FY20. We're working to decarbonize our existing business and scope one and two emissions were down by 9% last financial year. We have over 1200 megawatts of renewable PPAs in place and that will continue to grow. We're using artificial intelligence to run our assets, including a roaring power station and our production wells that are APLNG facilities more efficiently. Our virtual power plant um, now has more than 85 megawatts from over 11,000 customers. And Spike, our demand response trial is continuing to grow with now more than 25,000 customers signed up. We're also undertaking electric vehicle smart charging trial with the Australian Renewable Energy Agency. And the purpose of that is to manage and reduce the cost of EV charging, which will create value for EV drivers as well as the energy markets. And for our roaring power station, we've recently announced um, an expression of interest for a 700 megawatt um, battery storage project for there. So that is also kicking off. We're investing in opportunities to run more of our assets on renewable energy. Our LPG business has been um, installing solar panels on terminals where possible. And we're also pursuing opportunities in green hydrogen and am ammonia and carbon capture storage opportunities. So that's my brief overview of our approach to decarbonisation. Well, Heidi, thank you very much. Uh, we do have two uh, brief questions, if you could address the one from Aaron Craig uh, asking uh, why the coal plant isn't coming down for another decade. 
Um, and, and the se second question is whether your uh, origin is uh, tying uh, decarbonization, um, sorry, I missed, are you pursuing linked customer solar and customer electrification requiring, for instance, an EV charger or electric heat pump in order to qualify for rooftop solar? So if you just briefly answer those two, that would be great. Uh, sure. Um, so let me just see if I can find the call question. Um, so the reason Origin um, isn't coming down for 2032 is because it's quite critical to the grid over here. We have a number of, um, as I mentioned before, uh, our national electricity market is about 75% coal. And we have a number of um, a number of assets, coal-fired power stations that are coming out over the next decade. So maintaining capacity in the grid will be, or how we replace that capacity in the grid will be quite challenging and ARARing will be critical to ensuring that, that we maintain that stability through that process. So, um, so yeah, we're constantly evaluating, things are changing rapidly, but um, yeah, so ARARing is pretty cute, critical to ensuring that we maintain the reliability and the stability in the grid as we go forward. Yep, uh, so does Origin pursue linked customer solar and customer electrification? Um, we have, uh, so I'm not, if I understand the question correctly, we have like a solar battery um, program you can sign up to. There's also the virtual power plant. Um, I think the question is you force them to, to, to electrify their demand at the same time they're getting the benefits of the solar. Uh, there are a lot of questions here, but I think that that addresses what we have. So th thank you very much. We'll we'll come back to things um, uh, in the group Q and A session. Thank you very much, Heidi. I'm much appreciated. Next speaker is Patrick Patrick Pansiatici, and uh, he is from RTE Grid, uh, France. Yes. yes. Hi everyone. Yes, so um, yes, I'm from France and uh, I am uh, from RTE, so it's a French TSO. So perhaps my, the title of my presentation is uh, Evolution or perhaps Revolution of Power System. I believe that we are living a very big transformation of power system and uh, decarbonization in one, one of the target, but perhaps not the only one. And uh, <laughs> so I am from RMB and I am French, so so perhaps I will give something a bit more conceptual. I don't know. I choose to be a bit more some high level concept rather than to dig in some detail. But let's see what, if it's interesting for you. It's my pleasure to, to share that. So this is a map of um, this is a map of Europe. And uh, we, we know that uh, this large power system is the most complex machine ever built by humankind. And this system are becoming more and more complex. And we are a part of this big interconnection. So, so, so it's a very mesh grid in the middle. And uh, there is some connection for DC, for UK, or for the Nordic country, for example, and no connection with Russia, but some small connection with North Africa and, and Turkey. And RTE is managing the French network. So it's managing the transmission system operator. So we own, we develop, we maintain, and we operate the grid, just the grid. We don't have any, any, any generation asset. We, we just transmit power and we, we, we operate in the, in, the, in the very big market. It's a more European market than the French market. And, uh, and then we have a lot of coordination with of the TSO in Europe to, to deal with. So the question of uh, climate change, of course, is a big question. And, uh, and it's a part of our r and uh, uh, yes, vision to, to try to be part of that. And, and of course, we have very aggressive target in Europe and France about that. And, and in France, the problem is not so much to decarbonize electricity, thanks to a nuclear power plant that we have now. So it's not a big problem for now. But we need to understand what will happen in the future and if we have more uh, we have a switch from uh, fossil fuel to electricity in some applications, and perhaps we need more electricity. And of course, nuclear power plant is also a question mark. Uh, but we are very advanced, flexible nuclear power plants that are able to follow the load. It's very, very unique. And, 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 uh, and our predecessor in the business did that. It's uh, very impressive. 
the, the question of climate change is, is also a global question for sure. And uh, it's quite easy to push the problem in, uh, in other country or in the manufacturing process. Uh, so, so the problem is huge. And, and here I put some numbers about uh, what we, the problem we have that we don't have to use the existing carbon, carbon reserve. And it could be very difficult for us to resist because if we burn all the known reserve of coal, oil, and natural gas, that will lead to, Andrew, no, to around 3,000 billion tons of CO2. And we know that to keep uh, the global warming below 2 degrees C, we must burn only around 600 billion tons of CO2 until 2050. So we need to fight against this temptation to, to burn this, this coal, oil, and natural gas. And nowhere on the planet and, and it's very easy to buy PV panel in France and then to forget how the manufacturing process was done in China. So, so, so we must be aware of that. But climate change is just a part of the problem or just a piece of the problem. We, we believe that we have other problems that could be very challenging also. So, uh, and one could be the, the, the accelerating of the resource extraction and uh, it could be the case, for example, for sand. And, and uh, even if, uh, if we, are, we think that we have a lot of sand, it's, uh, it could be very critical in some country to, to, to have access to that. And if we don't pay attention, we can, we can have some problem about that. And of course, all the raw material and all the raw earth, earth, for example, we need to pay attention to, 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 to this extraction process. So we have something also about equity and uh, yes, this idea of uh, that for sure it could be possible to do something, but we need to, to, to keep the society uh, quite uh, uh, possible to live in. And, 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 and it, perhaps it's not a good idea to increase inequality in society. And, uh, and of course, we, we have this uh, problem in France when we, we create it. So, so government put a, a carbon tax <laughs> and it was perhaps a good idea to reduce the carbon emission, but then uh, the people that are living in the countryside with no public transportation, nothing was trapped with this carbon, uh, <coughs> this carbon tax, and they were very against, and we have some 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 problem and disorder to to to, to deal with that. And then the government stopped this uh, this idea of taxing carbon for the for all the people. So we need to pay attention to that. And also, also we have a, we have an impact on the on, 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 on the biodiversity uh, with all the industrial processes and all the, and, and, and and we must pay attention to that. If we if it's not a good idea if we decarbonize if we increase <laughs> the collapse of, of biodiversity, it's not a good idea. Perhaps so we, we must pay attention to that. And then also we can have very uh, some kind of effect of global warming, but perhaps something else. We can have uh, this migration that could be also a kind of problem for, for our society so we need to understand how to do that and not to and also to help the, so all the country and not to be to be selfish and to and to have a very advanced society and then to forget about people that would be very impacted by the climate change and then will be a problem even for us so and all these are very well documented in very very different report from very well-known association. So it's not, so it's, it's a very big problem with this uh, interdependent trends that, uh, that must be uh, taken into account together. Of course, we can have many ideas about uh, science and technology and collaborative uh, opportunity to, to, to try to find some solution. And of course, the digital digitalization is something that could help. And, and for example, the cyber physical system as a, as a concept to put more and more uh, digital solution in, in, in the system to, to address the complexity is certainly a good, good thing. And we need to understand how to do that. We have this digital twin also that is uh, very, uh, now very, it's a bit a buzzword, but anyways, you, you can, we can do a lot of, um, Yes, high performance computing, using high performance computing, you can do very advanced simulation of object before in the design and, 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 
in, in silico before doing something for real and, and to put them in the field. So, so we can optimize, yes, uh, the operation of system or even the, the maintenance of system using digital twins. And for sure, we need to develop more of that for industrial system. And we can have a source of inspiration by the natural. So there is a lot of biomimetism that could help. And we are looking at some solution uh, to try to mimic some uh, some natural process, even for, for the cement of the foundation of the tower, for example. We, we can find some example, yes, uh, in the sea, for example, how, what to do with this, um, this foundation. Is it possible to use something else than concrete or uh, to, to, to do that? Robotics is also a big thing that could help to, 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 to monitor everything or, or to, uh, to, to have access to, to very insecure environment and to, to, to be able to, to have a better assessment of the, the infrastructure and to be able to, 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 to do a better maintenance and to be more efficient. Of course, we have this uh, artificial intelligence that is a big big thing and, uh, and we believe that uh, that could help for sure to, 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 to tackle the complexity. But for critical infrastructure and for critical mission, we still have some challenge to, 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 to face and explainability and interaction with human that leads to the neuroscience thing that uh, what is it? <laughs> what is it? Is the human in the loop and how the human understand things and how they interact with very complex um, uh, algorithm or decision making process is also a question mark and the interaction between complex algorithm and human in the decision making process is for sure a big challenge for us. And then we have the connectivity and sociology for, of course, we have this social network that are very important now for, 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 to, 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 for information and for, for sharing information and for transparency. And uh, so it's very important to understand how to, how to use that to, to promote yes, uh, good solution and not fake news. <laughs> so, so, so it's a very difficult uh, problem and, and to explain very complex thing to a general public. Uh, and then we have the sociology. And of course, we, we must be aware of uh, the need of society. And if the people want to have local solution, uh, perhaps it's not a good idea. But if they really want to have that, rather than to have this large interconnection and to be a kind of, uh, to, have, to have this, uh, this figure to, to be more or less uh, to, bit autarcic and, and, and to be able to, to do everything locally, we need to understand that and to explain that perhaps it's not a good idea or perhaps we can do a part of that, but not everything locally. So yes, we, we, we must understand that, are, that what we were doing since the very beginning of power system to try to, to have this uh, technical economical performances of course, we must continue to do that to optimize the security of supply, the quality of supply, the cost for the cost for the community, the, the, yes, the consumer, and of course to also to, to ensure the safety around the, the, the equipment and everything. So, so this is what we are doing since the, the beginning of power system. Where we need to continue that, but perhaps it's not enough. And of course, this will change because we we can have some some incentive, but uh, we believe that we must anticipate and to be proactive to integrate more dimension in this problem. So we believe that we, we on top of this uh, classical dimension, we need to add four other one, something on, on solidarity about, uh, yes, uh, equity and uh, promotion, pro promotion of uh, social inclusion, health and uh, well-being. We must be aware of that and, and, and to be for example, if the people are afraid of electromagnetic field, we must understand that and we, we must try to, 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 to assess uh, if there is an impact or not. We believe not, but anyway, it's, it's not enough to believe. We need to, to, to demonstrate and, to, uh, and also to mitigate perhaps these kind of things. Of course, we have the, the ecology, the, the climate change is one part of that, but also to protect, regenerate the biodiversity around our, our asset. And of course, we have to prevent uh, the pollution and destruction of, uh, of the habitat of the, the animals and uh, vegetation and everything. So we need to understand that. And we have something that is very European, perhaps, and not very <laughs> clear for in US. We have this idea of frugality. 
that to say, okay, for us, it's a good idea to try to minimize uh, the things that we need. So, so perhaps uh, some people are to be extreme, but, uh, but anyway, perhaps it's not a bad idea to have a look and to try to chase away uh, to chase away waste and to question the necessity and the level of uh, of, of services we need. For example, we we we, we must understand that uh, we must design the building to to be more efficient uh, in cooling and heating and to put more thermal insulation rather than to to a very poorly designed building and then to try to optimize how to provide energy to to perform this cooling and heating. In, in buildings that are not very well isolated. So, so, so we need to think about that, not to, and of course, it perhaps it's not, um, it's not easy because our business is to, 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 to transmit electricity. So perhaps, <laughs> perhaps, it, and, 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 and then we need to understand the, 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 the final use of electricity and perhaps to reduce the use of energy when it's possible. And then of course we have to, to to, to take into account the, the resiliency of the resilience of the system. And of course, it's impossible to avoid the impact, but we, we need, we can mitigate the impact, we can limit the impact. For, and we are afraid to have more and more extreme disturbances and uh, the climate change could also lead to this variability of weather, not only a global warming, but also locally some very strange weather that the things that you have in Texas, for example, this very strange, yes, cold weather in, in Texas. and. And, and, and it will be very difficult to, 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 to do something that avoid that, but at least to, 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 to mitigate the impact could be, could be, could be a, good, a, good, uh, a good, yes, a, a good thing. And of course, it's a very complex um, system to, to do. Yeah, so, 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 okay. So of course, and for me, one conceptual question is to find the right balance between local and global solutions. Of course, we need to take advantage of distributed energy, SPG panel on the rooftop, behind the, meter, uh, behind the meter battery, flexible demand. But some people think that it could be perhaps a good idea to go to something that is more or less an island in microgrid. Perhaps it's not impossible, but perhaps it's more for rich people in a rich country or for in not so rich country to for low energy usage and just to have some lighting we played or charging on mobile phone, but for sure no eating, no cooling, and no cooking. And, and to make a joke, I, I say, okay, of course it's possible, and we have this international space um, station that is absolutely a nice microgrid. And of course it's possible, but perhaps it's not a good idea on Earth, but perhaps in space is of course mandatory. And then on the contrary, we can have this global, uh, this global connection, yes. And of course, we, we, we know that, uh, that this global interconnection uh, could take advantage of diversity of behavior and this uh, kind of smoothing of, uh, of uh, stochasticity. And of course, we can have economy of scale. If we have uh, some large wind farm, we can reduce. And in this large uh, windmill, we can, of course, reduce the cost. And, uh, and we have to think that we still have to deliver electricity to large industrial cons cons consumer and data center, for example. And of course, the best spot to, 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 to take energy, hydro, geothermal, or for sure, are sometimes yes, far away from the load center. So we need some grid in between. And I took this example very, that is quite interesting, that this project in Australia, <laughs> that they plan to, to I don't know if it's, uh, Fully serious, but it's, uh, I think it's a serious source that uh, that they, <laughs> they want to, to to build a very big solar plant with some battery to 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 send energy to Singapore. So it's uh, you know with with uh, three thousand kilometers of submarine cable. So it's just uh, impressive. But some people are thinking of global grid to interconnect the planet, and there is a working group in Sigrid that is working or studies this possibility to understand if it's possible or not. So, so the question to find the right balance between local and global is to perhaps to find the glue between, yes, uh, local and global. And I believe that digitalization is the glue to do that. And, 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 and uh, then we, we are moving to a more cyber physical system. So the keyword are virtualization, aggregation, decentralized solution, edge computing. And, and for me, it's an efficient way perhaps to integrate local solution in, in, in large energy market. 
we have this blockchain that uh, all, all the people are speaking with, that it could be a, a, an interesting uh, asset to, to have this peer-to-peer -peer connection. But also we, we can think uh, once again of all these cybernetics that uh, we can put local feedback, local control that add the complexity and literally the physics. So it's also a part of the solution. So I can go very quickly on the, on, the, on the more classical challenges of forced electron mobility, but all the people think about that. But I want to to say that of course location matters, and uh, and 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 of course we perhaps we need to upgrade the grid, and also fast dynamics matters. So it's not only uh, the, 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 something that is less than ten seconds uh, could have an impact on the stability of the system. So we need to think about that. It's not only about balancing. Or, and market design is also about uh, grid and uh, fast dynamics. Yes, hydrogen is also a big question mark in Europe. So, so and then also the competition between perhaps hydrogen and electricity as uh, energy storage of carrier. So, so of course we we we, we can think of a synthetic uh, gas or hydrogen or ammoniac to transport or, or transmit. And of course, for us, a big question mark is the location of electrolytes. Or do, do we have to put the electrolytes on near the, the generation of hydrogen or near the consumption of hydrogen? So, so we need to think about that and to find the good integration between electricity and hydrogen is a big question. And in France, yes, of course, we have a lot of nuclear power plant. And, and for us, the big question mark is about uh, this nuclear energy. So we plan to, to have a slow shutdown of this nuclear power plant, but it would be a big question for the carbon because if we now we are the electricity has not a lot of carbon in it because we have a lot of nuclear power plant, but if we stop them, then what we can do? So it's, it's, it's something that is a big question mark for us. So so we try to have a new 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 version of this nuclear power plant. It's called EPR and 1.6 gigawatt, but it's uh, very expensive. Now the cost of this first one, we hope that the other will be less expensive, but this one is 90, 19 uh, billion euro, and it's delayed now around, for around 10 years or so, so. But I think that perhaps some other nuclear technology could, could emerge, and there is a lot of project about these more modular reactors and there is a report from the, the International Agency of Energy that uh, give a, a full report on that. And of course, sometimes they are not so small. And for, for example, I took an example of this very disruptive solution that is a very small one. Uh, and, uh, and they think that they will have a prototype in uh, 2026. And, 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 and then perhaps if this solution emerged, then the, the landscape could change a lot. So uh, this is what I have. So thank you for your attention. So I think for me, the big question is balance between local and global solution and digitalization could be uh, a way to, 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 to glue these two parts, local and global solution. Thank you very much, Patrick. We, we do have one question which, you, which for you, which I, I wonder if you could expand briefly on, and that's the issue of inequality. And the question is, uh, this, this is from Robert Rowe, paraphrased here. Uh, should, should wealthy customers, uh, for, for example, pay more of the cost for developing, installing renewable equipment? Uh, or how do you, how is pricing of your products can be useful to address this issue? Yes, so so it's a big question, and at the end, very political. You know, so 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 so, so it's very depending on what the society wants. And of course, in Europe and in France, uh, the people are not against for for sharing the cost and to have a, a socialization of the cost. So so I'm not fully against that. So 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 so, so we believe that um, that of course now. There is a lot of public money involved in all these wind and solar things, and, mm -hmm. and now there is a tax that is uh, that is paid by all the people, yes, uh, to, 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 to support the, the, this green energy. But perhaps it's not very fair, and and, uh, and and we need to think about that because sometimes you know they are not, um, you know, they, 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 they are not. Um, using that for themselves, or I don't know how to say that. And 
But of course, now we have some incentive to, to, to put PV panel for everyone. But once again, we need to make the investment and uh, perhaps only the rich people can do that. So you, you have some, <laughs> you have some public money, but that go to the people that are able to buy some TV panel and then they are reimbursed. But, they, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but you need to have the money to, to, to buy the PV panel. So, so we need to understand that and to, because at the end, the people will be very against that they have to pay taxes just to send to give money to the rich people that are building PV panel on the rooftop. So, so, so it's true. So I don't know. That's a question. But. It's a difficult question, although it's it's also an economic question in that you have a lot of fixed costs, and whether you should convert those fixed costs into a variable price is is not at all not always clear what the, the best way is to recover those fixed costs but anyway that that is a, a debate that will continue for a long time i think uh let's let's turn now to the uh, group question and answer <coughs> session and also uh continue you can continue to pose i'm talking to the audience now you can continue to pose question to to any of the panelists as we move to this session and um, I'd like to start this off by uh, introducing uh, Liang Min, who uh, has uh, spent quite a bit of time in Texas and has uh, a question about uh, reliability in Texas at the moment. Uh, Liang, are you, are you prepared to chime in with a question? Yes, thank you, Charlie. I think this is also uh, received a couple questions from the audience as well regarding, you know, what are your thoughts on the current situation in Texas, with a lot of generation lost because of the natural gas supply issues, or also because of the wind and uh, the icing issue on the wind turbine or because of the transmission IC issues as Larry described. So what's your perspective of the current situation in Texas? And uh, what are the challenges you think that uh, Texas is facing? For instance, they don't have enough connection, even they have connection, connection, but they don't import or export electricity from Mexico or with a neighboring state. So what's your perspective on that? So we don't, not everybody has to answer this, but if anybody would like to tackle this question uh, among the panel, four panelists. Uh, um, I can say something very quickly. So, so I think the, the, the question is more, what is the reliability level we want? And so, so, so depending on the reliability level we want, we have to pay for that. So, so if the people never want to have any blackouts, of course, uh, we can be the system for that, but it would be very costly. So, so at the end, we need to address that. And of course, if the probability of extreme events increase, perhaps we need to change something. But then it's uh, how to assess that. And uh, but if this event happened only once each, I don't know, hundred years, so nobody cares. So I, I don't know. So so so, so 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 you know. So this is a reliability. You know, levels that we want and we have to pay for. Sure, I would point out that if your loss of low probability is one in one in 10,000, then every 100 years you can expect to lose a day or two. Yeah. Anybody else have any additions on this? Yeah, this is uh, Larry. Um, and, and I, the, that's a big question. Is it one in every hundred years or is it now one in every 50? Is it now one in every 10 or is it every year? And just think about uh, the migration of uh, California wildfires and how that changed over the last decade from what seemed to be seasonal um, to what was, uh, you know, and those seasons were kind of a summer, but it didn't happen every summer. And then all of a sudden it was every summer. And now, I mean, this last year, it was every month of the year. So um you have to ask is it different and, and talking with a counterpart uh, from oven grid uh you know for, with wind generators uh, that are in texas uh they're not designed for that thermal um you know characteristics that you would put something in minnesota or wisconsin um you know are you going to put the added cost into that for that three days of the year or this type of event same with their uh, generation plants um you know that their the natural gas plants are not designed for 
uh, cool seasons as well. So again, it gets back to Patrick's comment, you know, is it worth, you know, expending the funds for that? And, you know, uh, from a regional adequacy perspective, uh, how are you planning for that? How are you designing for that? So I, I think it is a, a big question. Um, and, and starting with, is this, should they be planning for an, an annual event? The last comment I would make is that ERCOT being separated, uh, uh, the WEC region being separated, you know, at what point do we start to consider some sort of planning that might put uh, DC interties in between of some of these regions uh, with, to be able to take advantage of some of the uh, renewables that might be in uh, central US or Western or Texas the same way? So is the DC intertie in, uh, in the Northern Plains, is that at capacity for the most part? Yeah, it, it, and that's I, just thinking about, um, you know, how we plan, we, we keep to our own regions. We don't think about crossing over <clears throat> and should we, should, should that be a consideration going into the future? Well, that'll be the subject of the March 3rd uh, uh, session on, on the group expanding the introducing more long distance transmission. So obviously it's an important question. Um, let, let me uh, let me let me ask uh, uh, another well actually does anyone else have anything to add to that before we move on to another question? We have about 20, uh, 20 minutes left. No okay, that's fine. So th this is a different kind of question. Um, I have two. Let me ask this the easy one first. This is for Elizabeth. And, and some, some people, it's not coming from me, but some of the participants have, have said that there's an elephant in the room of associated with, with shell decarbonizing. And that's, uh, of course, the, the main product it sells. How do, you, how do you handle that question in terms of talking about decarbonizing shell while specializing in the set sale of liquid carbon? Thank you. No, appreciate the question. Um, the short answer is that we address the emissions from all the energy that we sell. So we look at scope one and two for our own operational emissions. We look at scope three of emissions from use of energy sold by Shell from our own production. And we also look at scope three full life cycle emissions from energy sold by Shell that is produced by others also. So we have targets not just for our own operations, but for all of the energy that we sell. Um, and that is part of the net zero ambition that I talked about. Well, that's, that's, a, that's a good answer. Okay, uh, let, me, let me turn to a, another question and uh, this, this has come up with firms wanting to uh, take the initiative on decarbonizing their electricity consumption. And this is, this is primarily for the uh, utilities in, in the, in the, uh, on the, on the panelists. Would you be able to uh, market, I mean, establish a tariff uh, for electricity with a maximum content per carbon content per kilowatt hour averaged on a daily basis or some other time period? Um. Well, I'll be happy to start that. And, uh, and then maybe Heidi wants to jump in as well. Um, and, and I would say right now today, 25% uh, of our customers will pay for um, renewable credits uh, to offset. And uh, that signals to us that there definitely is a desire by customers to be able to do something of that nature. And uh, so be it as you're describing this percentage on or an average on daily, et cetera, we as utilities do need to figure that out. We need to be able to publish it. They're looking for that information. Communities themselves are asking for that. If they've passed uh, ordinances, for instance, to be 100% green, well, how are you providing that information to them uh, to be able to demonstrate that. So, uh, so that is absolutely uh, an effort that all of us are, are moving in that direction. But is that just reshuffling the, uh, the, the generation? Uh, you know, if half the people don't care, half the people do care. Do no, just... well, that, that's, and you're right, by buying credits, that's the way it 
most people would look at it that way. And um, as we move to being able to show what the real is, and and, and again, it's it's thinking about it from a real time perspective. So can I get that information um, at, at any time during the day as a customer um, is, is the desire that we're hearing. And again, communities want to see that as well. So, so there is definitely, I'll, I'll use a um, uh, number of our industrial customers who actually are paying for and, and, and helping us to build renewable facilities so that they have a direct link. And, and again, to your point, the electrons really won't go to their building necessarily. They're gonna go into the system. So what percentage and how that's shared. Uh, but, but to get to a net uh, zero by 2040, we're gonna to have to solve these issues, but we need that reporting to drive uh, us in that direction. Okay, um, I, I should remind the audience that they should feel free to submit, uh, submit their own uh, questions and uh, we'll provide the answer from our panel. Well, I can add something on that, I don't know. So, so <laughs> just to remind that, of course, you can control the flow of money and, <laughs> and you can pay for green energy but it's not what we are consuming. For example, if you consume one kilowatt more, I'm sure that the wind and the sun will not change. <laughs> so, 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 I'm sure of that. So, so, so then, of course, you can pay some green company and, and, and the money will flow to this green company, but electricity will not come from that. So, 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 and of course, we, we don't have to, 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 to mix the, the, the flow of money, the flow of electricity, and the flow of information. And, <laughs> and we, we need to understand that, that it's not the same. And, and of course, you can have some contract, but depending on the time scale, and, and you know, the economics, for example, is always a marginal cost. And, and, and you know, also it's a very marginal, and marginally, you, you know, Okay. So, so people have to understand that it's the flow of money, it's not the flow of electricity. <laughs> let me let me pose a, a question uh, uh, for Patrick. Um, when I was in Norway in the historic period of pre March <clears throat> pre March twenty twenty, uh, there was <clears throat> excuse me a lot of debate over whether Norway should be the battery for Europe. <clears throat> it has a lot of hydro, of course, and it's, they use it for their own consumption, but they were considering basically switching roles and putting in plenty of power lines down to the Netherlands and the continent and being a battery for Europe. Uh, and if you look around the globe, you have the Pacific Northwest or, or the Pacific uh, Southwest, if you're in Canada, uh, who could play a similar role. And if you go to the uh, Asia, you have the Himalayas, the hydro resources. Um, is that a, a viable uh, sort of international or, or long distance way of, of decarbonizing or using, using storage without really inventing anything? Yes, for sure. So, so I am you know, pushing a lot this uh, large interconnection and long distance interconnection. But then politically, there is some, <laughs> some issue about that. <laughs> and of course, you know, sometimes you have a bit, um, okay, this is, uh, the people from Norway are, uh, are using, uh, yes, uh, they're selling gas, <laughs> and then they are using green electricity. <laughs> so, and, and of course, with selling gas, they can invest in some green equipment. So perhaps it's not bad for the future, but uh, but we need to, to be aware that, uh, of course, they have a lot of money because they have this, <laughs> this oil and gas industry that bring a lot of money in their society. And, and then perhaps, so we, we need to be, um, to be aware of that. So when, they will manage, when they will do this kind of uh, big dam and everything, they will use perhaps some energy that is not so clean. So it's, it's one, question we have that not to move the, the, the CO2 on the manufacturing process. And, <laughs> and, and we have to pay attention of that because it's so easy to move the CO2, yes, more on the manufacturing process rather than on the operation. And we might find the balance between the two, but for sure it's, it's a good idea. They have a lot of hydro and, 
<laughs> and they are not so far away. So they are far away, but not so far away. And of course, politically also, it's easier that depending on North Africa or, <laughs> or that, that would be easier for us. Well, the Norwegians are not too happy about it, I don't think. Some of them, anyway. Or to depend too much on Russia, so, 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 so of course, so it could be <laughs> easier for us to depend on Norway, but to depend on Russia or North Africa. Yeah. And Larry, do you think the the North the, the uh, your part of the country would uh, look favorably on that? Maybe they already are serving that role in California. Excuse me, they didn't. They are they are already sending a lot of. Uh, uh, they're filling in the duck from uh, mm. hydropower. Of course, of course, of course. But they are not very efficient, but uh, okay. But anyway, so, 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 so you are losing a lot of energy, but if uh, you have a lot of energy that you don't know what to do with. So this is a question from Edison. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, Larry, what, what is your response? Well, for the, for the <laughs> I was quoting Edison on, the, on this idea of uh, storing storage and and uh, oh, oh, it's always a big question mark and what to do. So it's interesting that, um, you know, again, we kind of look at the history of uh, what took place here in, in the West. And if you go back to the 1960s and 70s, when the California, Oregon Intertie DAC systems were built and the DC was built from, from uh, Oregon here down to LA. Um, again, the fourth site at the time was that uh, there was peak Mead in, in California in the summertime. And so energy from the Northwest would flow during the summertime. And then uh, during the wintertime, when the peaks were in the North, the energy would flow from California up into the North. And that went on for quite a few years. And, uh, and now recently, um, things have really changed with the daily shifting with solar slash uh, hydro and, and the movement uh, back and forth. And so, um, yeah, it, again, I think as Patrick pointed out, the electrons are gonna flow where the electrons are gonna flow. Um, you know, the basics of physics uh, you know, will drive that. Um, but uh, there is the opportunity to uh, continue to think uh, and how we operate the systems um, and how we do impact each other. And I know uh, Elliot uh, Mainzer, who now is the director of uh, uh, over the California ISO was over Bonneville and, and so, but, you know, we can think more regionally. We have to think that way. And I'm sure that's true, as you were pointing out in Europe uh, as it crosses over. And, um, you know, political uh, issues can get in the way at times. Um, but, you know, really, uh, we as industry uh, need to really help and think through uh, what is resource adequacy? What is sufficiency at the time? How are you measuring those things? And how do we make sure that we have a reliable system that is cost effective? So, so lots of tough discuss discussions that are going on right now as we try to plan and build out these systems. But I would say that the technology and, and information has become so much more important to us to be able to understand what is happening in the real time instance. And, and so, um, our planning uh, is much, much better than it ever has been in the past, but getting that visibility into our systems is really making the difference. Okay. Um, any other comments from anyone? Okay, I have a question for, um, for Heidi at, at Origin. Um, you know, you're, you're looking to phase out your coal plant um, in the next decade or so. Um, wh where, where do you see the greatest opportunity to, uh, to, to maintain reliability uh, while expanding the uh, winter, winter solar to a substantial amount, uh, fraction of your generating capacity? Do you, do you see it on, in the storage domain? Do you see it in manipulating demand? Uh, do you see it on, on in some other margin? Um, can can you illuminate that where you see the greatest opportunity to maintain reliability while decarbonizing? So um, 
all of those will come into play. So our, how we relate to our customers. So things like the virtual power plant, which you know Larry and myself have um, spoken about. The how we um, our spike program, the demand response program in Australia. Rooftop solar uptake is one of the highest in the world. Um, so we, in terms of um, energy literacy and customers engaging with this space and then being able to also educate them about how they can manage their demand to manage peak demand instances as well is quite critical to this space in terms of how we digitalize things and how we move forward. Um, and then there's also uh, what do we replace the capacity with and how do we ensure that that reliability and stability of the grid is maintained and that's where things like storage come in come into play for that space. I can't remember if it was you uh, or someone else was talking about installing uh, uh, house, household level batteries and owning them and using them. Uh, is that does that play a, a role or are customers expected to shell out for, for battery backup? Um, so uh, customers can also buy like a solar and battery kit, but that does, um, they definitely do feed into the demand management response side of things in terms of how we manage that. I think it sounds like uh, Larry is um, there right getting, at the moment we're in the space where we're, we have what we call a spike hour. So we um, message the customers, you know, we're having a spike hour now to manage a certain demand period. Um, and, you know, can you turn off, you know, a pump, your air conditioner, those types of things. And it sounds like Larry has um, gone the next step further there and they're, you know, actually getting into people's, you know, being able to control people's devices. So. Okay. Yeah, no, the idea is spot on that you know, using it as a demand response and, and think about it from a transportation perspective too. Um, you know, the truck chargers that are coming that are a megawatt to a megawatt and a half uh, have a significant impact on a distribution feeder? Uh, do you have batteries in there to buffer? All of that comes to play here very quickly uh, in uh, helping the grid and where you have constraints on the system. You know, we call it the non-wire solutions at times, but you know, being able to plan for that is really important uh, and, and to be able to see it and operate it um, or influence it. Sometimes you don't have to have the direct operations, you know, but if you can influence it, and when it's charging, that makes a real difference. So, so yes, we're doing that and the home battery also with uh, vehicle charging times. Uh, because if, if you have a time of use, you know, a lot of, a lot of utilities jump very quickly to a time of use program. And so at 10 p.m. every night, you have this reduced rate. Well, if all, I'll just say six houses with electric vehicles all charge at 10 p.m., well, you just overloaded the transformer that uh, serves those six houses. So you know, effectively, you're not using the, the, the capacity in the system the right way. So, so we've got to get smarter about charging batteries, how they play here in, in uh, the flexible load. Good point. So here, here's the last, last question. I'll direct this to um, uh, Elizabeth. This is, uh, this is from Zeno uh, Switchdink. Um, and this is how does transporting electrons via hydrogen versus power lines compare? And I'm, I'm not sure this, this is something you feel comfortable answering, but anyway, uh, there it is economically, policy wise, and environmentally. So I think the question does an excellent job of raising the various dimensions that have to be considered in making those trade offs because um, the when you look at things strictly from an efficiency perspective, um, the paradigm shift that I mentioned moving from a fuel basis to um, a much more direct electron type of basis system really changes how we think about things because electricity has historically been the highest quality, most precious form of energy that gets used directly in things. And so we're used that we're just not used to thinking about it as the starting point um, as, as is now the case when you have solar and wind producing those high quality electrons directly. 
And so when you've got those electrons, efficiency-wise, the most effective thing to, is to use them <laughs> directly um, with what you're doing because usage of electricity, when you say look at electric motor and things like that, just the ability to do work out of that system is very, very high thermodynamically. It's just a very high quality energy carrier. And so when you start talking about conversions and you start, especially when you start talking about going up the ladder of molecular conversions, that efficiency profile just gets really, really challenging very, very quickly, particularly when you then have to come back to electricity, if you're coming back to electricity. If you're using, if you're, say, converting electrons to heat, that's a, that's a fairly efficient process. Um, and so if you're using heat as your end use, great. If you're using hydrogen as a feedstock, again, great, because you need that at, from, for its molecular characteristic. When you're coming back to electricity, um, it just it, it becomes a, about optimizing that option space. And so, when you start talking about you know, again the cost, the environmental pieces, the um, just space, just dimensionality that that is that is in that calculation. That's part of the reason why we look at these very integrated systems. I talked about that energy hub because it starts to help you frame up what for a given situation what is the usage profile for starting with those electrons great thank you very much um uh, we have uh, reached the end of our two hours uh very quickly i do want to give the panelists a, a oppor brief opportunity for any final words if they have them it's perfectly go okay to say i've already i, I don't have anything to say so uh, let's let's just go around, and uh, we might as well start with Elizabeth, since she's right here. Thank you. Um, just very much appreciate the opportunity, and really look forward to the rest of the sessions. Thank you. Thank you. How about Larry? Uh, again, uh, yes, I'll chime in by saying thank you as well. Uh, great discussion. Love to hear it. This international, Australia, Europe, uh, U.S. Shell being kind of spread all over. Um, great to, to to kind of have this variety. And and um, I guess I would just challenge us all take a look at uh, John F. Kennedy's uh, Rice University speech and think about what should inspire us. If we're going to the moon, and we're going to solve the greenhouse gas uh, issue. What is it? But but we all need to to be moving that direction. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Uh, Patrick? Yes. Uh, yes, thank you for the invitation. Yes, it was interesting to share, see, to see this idea and to share some idea with you. And I still believe that uh, the title Bits and What is very relevant. So, so, so <laughs> digitalization will play a, a big role in the, in the transformation of the system. So I believe that uh, some is a part of the glue that we need between local solution and global solution. So, so I think that uh, Bits and What is still a very good title. And <laughs> thank you for, for that. <laughs> thank you, Patrick. And Heidi, who's uh, already uh, way ahead of us, she's on Thursday. I am. It's early Thursday morning here. Now, I'd just like to say thank you for the opportunity. It's been uh, really great. The discussion's been really great. Fantastic questions and really interesting to see the perspective from all the speakers. So thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, I'd like to uh, um, thank you all for joining us. And on, on behalf of Liang Min, who's uh, our executive director, Bits and Watts, Arun Majumdar, uh, Ram Rajagopal, uh, thank you so much for joining us. And we look forward to uh, hosting uh, something on the grid similar to this in, uh, in two weeks' time. And I'd also like to thank Wahila Wilkie, who's uh, the, the woman behind uh, behind all of this. So thank you very much for all you've done for this way. Uh, thank you very much and uh, have a have a good day and um, Heidi, have a good morning.